Welcome to the Production Talk podcast with me, Jan of mixartist.com.au. In this podcast series, we celebrate the modern way of producing music. We want to talk about all things related to songwriting, recording at home and music production. So if you produce your music at home, this is the place to be. Please subscribe and recommend this podcast to all your friends. This is the Production Talk podcast episode 19. Welcome and hello everybody. Thank you for being on board again to yet another episode of the Production Talk podcast. It's great to have you on board again. Thank you very much. We've had quite a few new subscribers lately and if you are one of them, thank you particularly to you. It's great to have you on board. There are lots of old episodes that you might want to scroll through and see if there's anything interesting in there. Uh, my gut feeling is you might find a couple of, of interesting episodes for you. So please go through the old ones and check. And also let me know what you think about those episodes. You can reach out directly to me on the Facebook group called Production Talk Podcast Community. And it would be great to have you as a member on board there too. Today's episode is a technical one and I hope you can forgive me for this, but I've had quite a few requests asking about this strange term gain staging, what that means and how to do it and all of that. I've been thinking about this for a while, so I decided to make an entire episode about the concept of gain staging that will probably benefit many of you self-producing producers at home if you record your own music. So what is gain staging and what's it all about? Gain staging is important for recording and mixing and even mastering. And in some ways it even applies to what uh, streaming platforms will do with the music that we record. So gain staging is the method that you apply to route proper levels from one device to the next. Um, that could be effectively from a guitar to an amplifier. It could be from a mixer to a compressor. It could be from a mixer to a reverb unit and from a reverb unit to an interface. The range of possible combinations is pretty much unlimited. And we need to make sure that the level leaving one device is appropriate for the next one. So let's say if you're a guitar or a bass player, maybe you have experienced the difference between playing a passive pickup or an active pickup. And I think the general consensus is that, that active pickups on guitars and uh, bass actually produce a hotter signal, which immediately makes your amplifier sound differently because a hotter signal arrives. In some ways, this is already gain staging uh, because you may now decide to turn down the volume on your guitar or on your bass to manipulate the sound that you get on your amplifier. Um, we can take this concept further and it basically applies to every single aspect of uh, recording and later mixing and mastering. And a good gain staging is what I would call the secret source of really good recording engineers. It's the underlying skill that can make or break a recording. However, it's uh, one of many aspects. So we shouldn't look at gain staging in isolation as the cure for everything. It's, it's one element in a chain of different workflows. And uh, we should not ignore other workflows like the sound of your instrument, the playing technique, the room you're in, the microphone technique. All of those things are obviously very important. But once you've got those sorted, gain staging will make a big difference to the success of your recording. So let me explain a few things we need to know in order to understand gain staging better. In one of our first episodes, we discussed different level types and we came across things like microphone level, instrument level, also known as guitar level, and then line level in contrast to those. Um, they are all different and Let me just focus on line level for a moment. When we talk line level, it's an international standard that allows you to output a signal of one device, let's say produced in Australia, and interface that with a different device, let's say built in Europe, from different manufacturers. 
they all follow the same level standard and that's why these signals are compatible, which basically uh, makes all the signals that operate on line level compatible with one another across the globe. We effectively have an international standard that everybody uh, follows and that has some huge advantages for us as users. It basically guarantees if our levels are sitting in a certain pocket, they can be routed from one device to the next, to the next, to the next. And we never hit any roadblocks or we never make any mistakes. So what the heck am I talking about? What are those roadblocks or what are the problems that could occur? Well, if we think about analog devices such as analog mixers or compressors and so on, we generally refer to two extremes or you know two boundaries that's the better word on the very top is uh, the clipping point or distortion point so if you turn something up too much eventually you will drive a device into clipping and the device will sound distorted this is a good thing sometimes for guitar amplifiers but it's very rarely the case for mixers and compressors and so on unless of course that's what you want to do for the fun of it but in most situations, this is not what we want. So if you fed a signal too loud into a device, you would be at risk of causing distortion. And uh, that is definitely not something we want to do unintentionally. On the other end, we have what we call the noise floor. That's the self-noise of a device. So every time you pass a signal through an analog mixer or a compressor or an amplifier or any other device, a little bit of noise floor is added. And this noise floor, imagine that to be fixed at a fixed level. So if you now pass your signal through the device at a really low level, it means that your signal now travels closer to the noise floor. And if you were to gain this up at a later stage, you can recover the level that was lost. However, you will now also increase the signal of the noise. And that might not be fantastic. So to describe this concept, we usually use the term of signal to noise ratio. And if you follow line levels, you can rest assured that you have a really, really decent signal to noise ratio and uh, that you also have a little bit of headroom which prevents the signal from going into clipping. So in other words, if you follow line level well, you stay away from our two enemies, self-noise on the quiet end and distortion if it's too loud. Those things should be avoided. Good, okay, let's get a little bit more technical. The line level that we refer to is also known as studio operating level. And the technical description of that is plus 4 dBU. Well, this is a technical term. And uh, to explain that further, we need to understand that voltage travels through these leads from A to B or from one device to the other. And it's the voltage that transfers the signal. So in other words, if you drop the signal strength or loudness, less voltage travels through the cable. And if you increase the volume, the amplitude, then more voltage will travel through it. The studio operating level that I defined as plus 4 dBU will come up with an average, or RMS, that stands for root mean square, of 1.23 volts for studio operating level. Please note that this is an average level. It is not the loudest level that we ever see. So most devices have what we call headroom built-in to allow for short-term transients to, uh, to exceed uh, the line level without distortion. Most devices have a good healthy 10, sometimes 15 dBs, but there's actually no guarantee for those numbers. The headroom of the devices may differ from device to device, so it's a good idea to learn how your devices work on this end. So at this stage, it's important to distinguish between the peak level, that's the loudest peak that we will ever see, and the root mean square or RMS level. So if you um, visualize the waveform of an audio recording in your DAW, they often have a big chunky mid in the middle, which some people call the meat of the signal. That's what we would probably associate with the RMS of the signal. In addition, you can see some spikes popping out. I sometimes refer to those as a Bart Simpson haircut. And those are the peaks. Those are often transients, 
often triggered by percussive signals such, such as kick or snare. And those ones can stick out a bit more, but it's the RMS level that is me measured in 1.23 volts RMS, and that's what we define as our line level. Good. So if you, if you want to use the standard, you first need to gain up your microphone signals to match this level. And that's exactly what we do with microphone preamps. When it comes to the output of microphones, then we will not find a standard such as 1.23 volts at all. Instead, the level of microphones can differ significantly. Let's say if I whispered into a microphone or yelled into a microphone, the voltage at the output of the mic would be significantly different. If you play a flute from three meters distance, you would have a tiniest bit of voltage. If you shove a microphone into a kick drum and a rock drummer hits it hard, we might have a lot of voltage. So the voltage range that microphones produce can easily span like a factor of a thousand. And that's pretty extreme. That's why we need a microphone preamp to compensate for that. Those preamps are usually designed to cover a huge range of gain, quite commonly about 60 decibels, sometimes more, occasionally also less. And that basically allows you to take almost any signal up to 1.23 volts RMS. That's the goal of a microphone preamp. Good, okay, so I think um, we now need to talk more about how to use gain staging in the real world. Where does it actually start? Well, some people would say it starts right here at the preamp. But I would basically pause right here and say, let's go back one step further and look at the signal that you record and the microphone that you use. If you go back to episode number two, my microphone locker episode, you will find that uh, we already discussed lots of things about microphones and we briefly touched on the subject of microphone sensitivity. So that is something that I now need to explain in a little bit more detail. What is microphone sensitivity? Imagine some technical engineers in lab coats in an acoustic laboratory. That is often what we also know as an anechoic chamber. We're not talking technical stuff. We're putting the microphones on the test bench. What they do in those anechoic chambers is to set up a speaker and an amplifier. And now they produce a certain sound level of a standardized value. If you want to go specific, it's a 1 Pascal or 94 dB SPL. But that's just on a side note. Then microphones are placed at one meter distance aiming straight at the speaker. So if we now exchange the microphones and the sound source, also called stimulus, stays the same, we can now measure the relative volume difference from one microphone to the other. In other words, in this test scenario, one microphone might produce a couple of millivolts, another one only half a millivolt, and the next one maybe 300 millivolts. In other words, each microphone produces a different amount of voltage given the exact same input signal and the same distance and so on under acoustically perfect conditions. That's exactly what we call microphone sensitivity. You could also say that microphone sensitivity describes how hot a microphone is. Okay, all of this was really technical. How would you test this? Well, one way is to look up the tech sheets of your, of your microphones. However, I know a better way. Take all your microphones, line them up next to one another. Put on some headphones, maybe turn your speakers off for now. Then start with the first microphone, speak into it at a consistent level and gain it up until you hear it well on your headphones. Like the typical recording level that you would usually use. Then just quickly cut your headphones when you disconnect the microphone. Plug in the next microphone and don't change the gain for now. Listen again. Chances are that when you speak at the same volume, you now hear this, the second microphone either louder or quieter than the first one. Now make a note. Microphone 2 is, let's say, quieter than microphone 1. And you keep continuing with every single microphone. You will find that they all produce a different volume. On your bench in front of you, Sort them from left to right, from the most sensitive, that's the loudest one, to the least sensitive, that's the quietest one. If you want to put labels on them, 
if you figure this out about your microphone, you have a huge tool at hand. That's the microphone sensitivity. And that helps you to pair the microphones with their sound sources. So here's the underlying principle. Opposites attract. In other words, if you have a very loud sound source, let's say a kick drum, a Marshall amp, things like this, then you want to use a microphone of lower sensitivity. So in other words, a loud source and a quiet microphone. The opposite also applies. Let's say if you want to record a shaker at two meters distance, then you have a very quiet signal. In this case, you want to pair this with the most sensitive microphone you have. That's the one that produces the highest output. Sometimes if microphones are of similar ranges, you have a couple of choices and a bit of room to play. But what you definitely want to avoid is to pair the same things, meaning pairing a very quiet sound source with a very quiet or low sensitivity microphone. Because the output of those two will be such a small amount of, uh, of voltage that your microphone preamps may now struggle to gain it up. The same applies for very loud sound sources. So if you need to mic up a rock kick drum, probably don't use the most sensitive microphone because together they will produce so much voltage, it might already produce too much voltage for your preamp to handle. So the key is that opposites attract. A loud sound source with a, mic with a quiet microphone and a quiet sound source with a loud microphone. That's a really good starting point. What this will achieve for you is that you'd never need to use your microphone games in the extreme positions, meaning very low or very, very high. Often that's where preamps don't work at their very best. You can take the concept further by applying the same to tone. For example, if you find that one of your microphones is brighter than the other, do not pair this microphone with a bright sound source. So let's say if I had the brightest microphone in my locker and um, let's say a brighter female voice with a strong sibilance, those two would not make a good pair together because chances are pairing a bright voice with a bright microphone will make the sibilance go completely out of control later and I'll just chase my tail in the mix and in post-production. So if you have a bright, thin sounding voice, use one of your darker microphones. And the opposite obviously applies as well. So if you've got a darker sound source in tone, you may want to consider using a brighter microphone for that. That will sort of balance things out right at the source. So in addition to gain staging using microphones, we can also now say that we already balance out the tone. Tone staging? Not sure if that's a thing, but I guess you get my point. The key is opposites attract here. Okay, so why is all of this important? Your preamps cover a huge range of gain and I find that most preamps don't sound very good in the very topmost position. Often I find that as the gain increases, um, the noise flow of the preamp also increases but not necessarily in a correlated manner. Means that the noise floor can increase disproportionately. So I usually try to avoid the most extreme settings, cranking a gain up all the way. And if I feel that this might be necessary, I rethink my microphone choice and see if I can get the microphone a bit closer to the sound source or switch it for a more sensitive microphone, which now means my gain control, my microphone preamp, operates in, well, what I would call the comfort zone. That's the area where it just operates at, at, at its best. Okay, good. I hope this makes all sense to you. So that's where we start. In the room, aiming the microphones, um, playing with the distance, playing with the choice of microphone so that our preamps don't have to do all the heavy lifting. Just before we move on, um, in case the signal arrives too hot, which can happen with very loud sound signals, most preamps will actually have a little press button which is labeled pad. Pad is effectively um, a simple circuit that adds a resistor right before the microphone preamp input stage. And this resistor will uh, lead to a drop in level um, before the signal hits the, the preamp. So 
the DB range of your pad control, that will depend on your device. Sometimes that's negative 10 dB, sometimes negative 20. But usually pressing the pad will get a very loud input, incoming signal back into a range where a microphone preamp can handle it well. Good. If pad is not available, increase the microphone distance or choose a microphone of lower sensitivity. That's, I believe, all I wanted to say about gain staging using microphones. Now let's move on to the next step, which is effectively turning up the gain controls and how much. Well, for most people, this is a very simple concept, but it's actually so not. Experienced engineers have perfected the, the art of gaining up signals. And I would say that with enough experience, this can make a huge difference for the recording process. And if things go really badly, this can also obviously cause negative side effects on all following stages of the production, from editing to mixing to mastering eventually. So what do you need to know about turning up the gains? Well, if it clips, turn it down. I hope that everybody agrees. Um, we don't want to record too hot. Digital clipping is not something we want. It's not something that sounds good. And I don't think there is any useful purpose for recording a clipped signal. Although I have to say that some engineers have told me that they can hear a difference. Um, whether that's true or not is yet to be determined. But I remember I once met an engineer who told me that his drums sounded best when he just gained them up a bit into the clipping range for the analog warmth he got. Well, figure that. Um, and then he also told me that recording these clip drums sounded better in one DAW over the other, which really makes me wonder what this guy was smoking. Look, uh, in all honesty, I believe that is not the right thing to do. So um, don't record clipped signals, please. You will probably regret this later. So if it's clipping, turn it down. That's a firm rule that we should all uh, follow. The next is the concept of remembering gain positions. Well, I'm all for fast and effective workflows. And if you've worked out a certain workflow, it's a smart idea to remember it and being able to replicate it again and again accurately is a good thing. However, I've also met people who said that Whenever they record a vocal, they turn the gain up to the 12 o'clock position as a general rule, independently of who they record and what microphone they use. And that's where I would say, no, that's no longer working. So generally speaking, I don't think it's a smart idea to memorize uh, things like every guitar must be recorded at a gain at three o'clock, three o'clock and vocals at 12 o'clock or so, that's not a wise idea. Instead, apply the amount of gain that the incoming signal needs. And the best way to get your signals up there is to watch your meters. I guess you're aware about meters because you know about clipping, and those are the things that turn red when you clip. So, as we said before, that's not where we want to be. But where in the green or orange on some meters do we want to be? So, therefore, we first need to understand meters in a little bit more detail. Some audio interfaces show you meters on the front. A very popular example is the Focusrite Scarlett. Amazing sounding interface for the price tag. They're very popular for a good reason. And there's a little LED circle around the gain control that lights up as you speak into the mic. And it actually changes, changes color. So when it gets too hot, it will start to turn red. This is your meter already. This is your first meter. But in all honesty, it's a rather coarse one. It's not very detailed. So here's the problem with meters. Whether you use that one on the Scarlet or on your other interface or in your DAW. None of the meters has enough real estate to actually show everything that's going on. And by that, I mean, our human hearing can digest a volume range from 0 dB SPL to about 120 dB SPL. That is a whooping range of 120 decibels. 
And no meter that I'm aware of covers all of those 120 dBs very accurately. So, instead, each type of meter highlights a certain area of these 120 dBs. And there are certain things that are designed or that are set in the meter type that you use that magnify one range and have less or show less emphasis on another. You can imagine um, taking your camera, let's say a digital, um, what's it called, DSLR camera, a DSLR camera, and you would like to take a photo of a skyscraper. If you're close by, you will find that not the entire uh, skyscraper can be in focus. Once you focus the top of the skyscraper, you will find that the mid and bottom um, section is somewhat out of focus and blurry. If you change the focus to highlight other areas, suddenly the peak or the, the top of the skyscraper is no longer in focus. And meters work just like that. The problem is that each DAW uses a different type of meter. They behave differently in speed or reaction time and also in scale, means which of the areas is in focus and which of the areas are out of focus. And to make it even more complicated, a lot of DAWs allow to change the meters. And I'm using Pro Tools here as an example. Um, Pro Tools has a huge range of different meeting, metering options. And I think it's really good to have those. So let me just sum up some of the most common ones. In most DAWs, the default meter is known as a peak meter. A peak meter is um, yeah, like focusing on the loudest bits of your signal. Those are the absolute peaks of kicks and snares and transient material, percussion, percussive material. That's what they magnify a lot. However, they don't magnify what I called the beef of the signal or the chunky bits, the, the loudness range of, of a signal very well. So if you only follow peak meters, you don't get a good indication of how loud two signals are in relation with one another. Let me take, let's say, a distorted guitar and a timbale or other percussive instruments. If you record those next to each other and just watch the peak meters, you will get a very bad indication of how loud they actually sound relative to one another. However, you get a good indication of where their loudest peaks are. I personally prefer to switch my recording meters to RMS and peak mode in Pro Tools. When I choose RMS mode, I use the same method, root mean square, that is applied to our line level of plus 4 dBU. That was also measured as 1.23 volts RMS. And by RMS, we now mean that the focus of the meter is towards the loudness or the chunky bits rather than the transients that stick out of the signal. In case of the Pro Tools RMS meter, it also shows a very thin line. It's just one pixel wide, uh, which indicates where the peak lies. So it actually shows both. That's why I personally prefer them. Here's my method of setting recording levels when I track a band in Pro Tools. I first think about the finished mix. And just for a second, let's just visualize the waveform overview of a finished mix. The mix file should still show us the beefy bits in the middle, where the loudness sits, and in addition, the spike sticking out that Bart Simpson haircut. So what are those things that stick out most? there's a very good chance that we would identify kick and snare. Um, in some situations, it may be something else, but it's probably a different percussive instrument. In Latin music, for example, it could be a cowbell, things like that. Whenever I record a band, I try to gain up that signal first, whatever the loudest is. In case of a band recording, probably kick and snare. And I would now gain up my preamps so that the meter in Pro Tools reads about negative 20 RMS, give or take. Negative 20 RMS on some Pro Tools converters is exactly the same as plus 4 dBU or 1.23 volts RMS. So I'm basically sticking with the line level recommendation. 
Please note that depending on the audio interface uh, that you use, this range in the digital domain might be a little bit higher or lower. But it's definitely not 0 dBFS at the very top. It's usually around the negative 18 mark, sometimes negative 16 on, let's say, apogees. Uh, sometimes it can be configured. Good. So if I, get, <clears throat> if I record my kick and snare so that the meters show about negative 20 RMS, or possibly make the decision to compress the signal slightly to tape, meaning before it hits my converter, to reduce the peak level a little bit, little bit. However, that's an aesthetic choice, and I would never decide uh, on compression based on meters. That's not a good idea. It's got to be an aesthetic choice. So once I gain up my kick and snare to read negative 20 RMS in Pro Tools, I would now continue gaining up signals relative to kick and snare. So in other words, if I wanted to record a signal that is meant to be fairly quiet in the mix, I would actually record it a bit quieter as well. And I would always use kick and snare as my reference points. So when I gain up, let's say, the tom or an overhead, a hi-hat, I ask myself how much volume would I want to make the drum set sound level balanced. And that's how I would record it. Since kick and snare are the two signals that <clears throat> stand out of my mix most, all the other signals will naturally be recorded at a lower level and I don't need to worry about clipping anymore. So when I do a band recording, I try to record the signals so that I basically have a leveled mix with all the faders at unity. Means none of the fader has been moved. I find this is a very good workflow. Um, it's definitely not the only workflow in the world, but it makes uh, my life a lot easier when I mix the songs that are recorded. Good. When it comes to making those decisions, there is obviously a lot of personal choice, and we always need to consider the gear that we work with. So, after explaining my workflow to you, I have to wave a little flag and raise a little disclaimer here. Obviously, I always listen very carefully to how things behave. And if I notice that a certain preamp or microphone is not really happy sounding or doesn't, doesn't sound clean to me, I will change my, my gain staging workflow according to what I hear. So to me, my workflow is not set in stone, and it shouldn't, of course, but I always reconsider it as I use new gear. Some gear is very happy to record a little bit hotter. Other gear starts to get a bit fuzzy around the edges, and that can also be something that I want. Organs, for example, might sound quite nice if they're driven a little bit. However, in most cases, I prefer to record the signal uh, on the cleaner side and make those mixed decisions later. Okay, so if you want to give my workflow a try, I would say give it a good shot. Um, my gut feeling is that your recordings will uh, turn out better this way. However, uh, as I just said, take it with a pinch of salt and always ask yourself, okay, is that the right thing to do in my scenario? So your preamps may want to guide you down a different path. That is perfectly fine then. Okay, good. And with these words today, I'd like to finish this episode. It was very technical. I hope you got something out for yourself. Um, please recommend this podcast series to all your friends. I would really like if you could please hit the subscribe button right in your podcast player. And if you go to the end of the episode, you can also open up the show notes for this episode where we, you will find further information. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm very much looking forward to speaking to you again next week. Everybody have a great time. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.